Okay. Okay. Hello, it seems kind of low, but I think we're okay. Do people can hear it. There's some sound. Yes, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to 8 by 8 I apologize that we don't have seating for everyone. Thank you for standing up. <laughs> um, I guess this is a popular event. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Linda Ganjan. I'm a local artist, and I'm the founder of JH Art Talks. Um, in case you don't know, JH Art Talks is a local art talk series that I started in December 2016 which features Queen's artists. So you can find out more at our website, jharttalks.com. Um, our next event is on May 11th with two sculptors, Raul Delara and uh, Jed Marino. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm excited to be partnering with Epicenter New York City for this event. This is our first collaboration. Uh, we've both been highlighting artists in our communities. So this seems like a natural partnership. Um, so thank you to the artists who are going to be presenting tonight. Uh, one, and thank you to Espresso 77 for hosting us. One note. Uh, one note, uh, one of the artists, Heidi, what is it? Heidi Howard is not gonna be able to present, unfortunately. Um, so that's it. I'm going to pass the mic over to Daniel La Plaza to talk about Epicenter New York, and then we will begin. Hi, everyone. Wow, this is your cat house. This is great. So, hi, everyone. I'm Daniel La Plaza. I'm Epicenter's community manager, and to see the number of people here for an art event like this is, like, actually breathtaking to me right now. Um, I'll just say a few words about Epicenter. It started off as a locally run uh, newsletter around pandemic and pandemic related information, specific around basic information needs, how to get vaccinated, how to protect, and how to do it in a way that is practical and, and you know accessible. And since that launch, we've flourished into so much more than that. As you can see from this event tonight, we have now live streams, hi everyone, uh, podcasts, and several other newsletters, as well as a very um, elaborate website that can uh, expand a little bit more on community art um, and anything you kind of need for, you know, um, Epicenter, I mean, excuse me, um, New York community needs. Um, so as, as I said, you know, this is one of many and this is a wonderful collaboration. And I just want to make a quick note that this was possible today because Linda was one of the Epicenter members. And this is a story that I love so much that I was a participant of one of our weekly yoga sessions and just checking in to see how things went. She said, hey, by the way, I run this uh, local art uh, talk. And I said, well, let's uh, get together and work something out. And the fact that all, all of you are here today is, is uh, wonderful. So thank you so much for being here tonight. And I'm sure you're going to have a, a pleasure to see uh, some of these local artists and what they have to offer tonight. All right. Yeah. Um, Kisha and Jasmine, you will be first, so if you want to make your way up. So we're not reading bios, the bios are on the table. So, um, and I will give you this remote clicker. And um, here is the mic. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, thank you guys. And the video is just, uh, I think if I can try that, it's not all good for my Um, We're going to start with a quick video. <laughs> Good 
Good morning, Abeo. It's Jasmine from the Winston-Salem Portrait Project. This is your name badge. You want to sit at the table with some instructions and pay for the A lot of fun and a lot of getting to know each other's plan for you all today. Jabari, I am a photographer. I'm a passionate community gardener. Gardening saves my state of mind. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am totally amazed and blown away that you're living now where I used to live at as a kid. In a half an hour, you're going to go into the portrait studio and you want to capture this person's personality. Each other. We're both really passionate about the city and about people and about fairness. My name is Keisha Bari and this is Jasmine Chang, um, who is a new resident of Jackson Heights. <laughs> so, Jasmine and I have been working together on and off for the last 10 years, um, mainly through um, the, the photo festival Photoville. Um, so we are no strangers to working together. Um, but we're talking about the Winston Salem Soldier Project tonight, which is something that um, is very close to our hearts. Um, I received an RFP from a friend, who's a public artist, in 2017 um, about a pro portrait project from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, that um, he said, you should, you should be perfect for this, you should try, you should, you should apply. And I was like, I've never done a public art before. I'm like, what are talking about? But I read it through and I was like, oh, I can kind of do this, but this is a big project, I can't do it on my own. So I asked Jasmine to if she'd be interested in applying. So the community, the, uh, the Arts Commission required this us to submit a proposal that encompassed both community engagement, photo portraits, and a permanent sculpture um, and uh, as part of that proposal. And historically, Winston-Salem is also a very segregated city, it still is, and they also wanted uh, the project to build bridges across communities. So. Um, it, Jasmine and I got to work on a very, very multi-layered proposal um, and between us we have extensive production, community engagement and photographic public art experience. Jasmine also uh, is the co-founder of the Community Heroes Project in Fort Green. Um, but we won the commission in July of 2018 and we were very excited but we were also terrified because we've never built a sculpture before. So this was the first. The mic is not on. Is it? Can you hear? It's uh, totally fine. Yeah. 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 You just, I got to talk about it real quick. Yeah. Uh, how's this? Yeah? In the ear? Can you hear like this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so when we started the project, um, we knew that we weren't locals to Winston-Salem. We're New Yorkers, and so we really needed um, we really needed help. We really needed a core group of local community members to help us with making decisions and really help with driving the project. So we brought together a group of community members, and um, we called them our host committee. And so um, Winston, the city of Winston-Salem is it's kind of like a pizza pie. It's it's a large it's a small large city, and it's divided into eight wards. Um, and each ward is kind of like a slice of pizza. And so, kind of, and each ward is basically like a borough. Um, it's a much smaller version of New York City boroughs. And so we really, throughout the project, use these eight boroughs as like a guiding principle. And we use them to kind of make sure like every step that we were doing, we were really thinking about all um, the city like in its entirety. And so we put out a call for our host committee members. And, um, and we were looking for a couple community members per city board. Um, we spent a significant amount of time like meeting each person individually, and then we got them all together for a big kickoff meeting. And it was really important to us to um, spend time bringing this group together and to bring a group together that was uh, very diverse, um, people from all across the city, and people who just had different perspectives of the city. Because if we were to create a project that would be diverse and intersectional, we really needed to start with this group that was driving the project. Um, and we also, like, we like to think about our outreach process as kind of a two-step outreach process. So the people who were part of our host committee who heard about it, got involved in it, just the way that community engagement and kind of work with the city goes, these people were probably going to be the usual suspects of people to participate in a project like the Winston-Salem Portrait Project. So we thought people to be part of our host committee and to kind of be like ambassadors of the project and we would actually broaden the group of people that could be part of the project. Um, so yeah, so this is some of our host committee. Their first job was to identify participants for the project. And um, we asked them to think about people who, like, very simply do good for their community. Um, we asked them to also think about people who are not normally in the spotlight, um, to think about people whose story really expands the narrative of the city, um, and of course, like, people who were willing to, to do the work of building bridges. Um, and so over the course of five months, they fanned out and did outreach, they called community meetings, they talked to their neighbors, they put the word out on social media, and um, at the very end, we got everyone together uh, from the host committee to look through all the nominees that came in uh, and to together select the final participants of the project. Um, that was 64 people all across the city um, to really represent and uh, bring together like a diverse group of people around the city, a diverse and intersectional group of people around the city. Um, so this picture is a day where Kisha and I locked ourselves in a room for, we didn't think it was going to take 15 hours, but I think it ended up taking 15 hours. So. Every single post-it, every single page of paper was a participant that was selected for the project. And we um, did what I jokingly call community matchmaking. So everyone in the project, we were gonna pair or group together. And we were really intentional and thoughtful about this process. So um, we, um, yeah, we wanted to bring people together and think of thinking about a number of different factors. So um, thinking about people's age, thinking about like race, religion, um, thinking about gender identity, um, thinking about where in the city they were from. We yeah, group people together. And um, yeah, we generally we just like we wanted to pair people together who had 
fairly different lived experiences, um, but we were also really looking for kind of common threads between them where they could find like shared interests. And that brings us to uh, building a workshop. So a few months later, in June of 2019, we ended up with uh, ultimately 60 participants who each attended one of four four-hour workshops. So the video you saw earlier was um, the participants participating in their workshop. Um, the workshop had a number of uh, group icebreakers. I gave them a quick 20-minute workshop on how to create meaningful portraiture um, based on what they learned from each other. And then we paired or grouped them together. Some of them, we ended up with some, losing some participants. So some of them are two twos, some are in threes. Um, and the groups then did some activities and lunch together to get to know each other. And when we sent them to the portrait studio, they got creative and um, we sort of get from the basics of using a DSLR and they used the conversations that they had and created their own art based on what they learned from one another. So this is some behind the scenes of them participating. Uh, finally, I took a portrait of each group together to convey the connection that they made throughout the day. And then we had them write an artist statement to explain why they took the photos that they did. Um, this is a screenshot from our website. It's wsportraitproject.com if you want to learn more about the project. It's, it's more detailed than eight minutes. <laughs> um, then finally, uh, we created the sculpture. <laughs> Um, presto. Um, so with the, the final artwork is in three parts. There's a sculpture, there were eight murals, and a participant exhibition. Um, originally planned for an unveiling in the summer of 2020, the artworks were delayed due to the pandemic, but were finally installed and celebrated in April 2021. So the blueprint of our sculpture was created in 2018 with our proposal, so it was so beautiful to see this sculpture come to life of a 3D rendering that we had for three years. Um, so I mean, used a local uh, fabricator, Aaron Gibbons, who was just fabulous to work with, just incredible, incredible artist. So um, we used building blocks uh, or cubes as a, a representative of the building of bridges across the city. There are gaps, bridges and holes among the cubes. And the nature of the blocks allows the idea of infinite community building and layering. We installed stainless nick steel mirrors panels also to, so that anyone who came to view the sculpture would see themselves reflected in the artwork. We were really, uh, and also the surrounding city um, as a background. It was really important to us that viewers felt included in the artwork when they engaged with it. 60 people could never truly represent the city. Um, they were only indicative of it. The cubes display all 27 group portraits and a short bio of each participant that Jasmine and I drafted, but then made sure everybody had time to review and edit their bio before to make sure that it was represented them before we had it um, had them engraved to panels. Um, so these are the murals. Um, the murals, uh, there are eight of them all around the city, one in each city ward. And we came up with the idea of the murals because uh, really because of budget. Um, the city had really wanted artwork all over the city, but with the budget that they had for the project, they're like, there's no way we can build eight sculptures. So we came up with the idea of making like two-dimensional representations of it. Um, you'll see the photos you see. There's one in a park, there's one in a community center, and there's one, um, this is at the Southside Library. And this was, all the locations were picked by our host committees as places that people just already gather or use a lot. Um, and the last piece of our project is the participant exhibition. So these, this featured the portraits that the participants themselves took of each other in the studio, and it also showed their artist statement. Um, there were some behind the scenes photos on it, um, as well as some text that just shared their reflections of the day. And this was really important to us because like, this project so much was about kind of the outreach and relationship building and the workshop and kind of all that happened there and kind of without seeing some of the behind the scenes like people might not get that from the sculpture so um, this piece of it we really wanted to kind of show just like a little bit of that relationship building a little bit of that magic from the workshop 
So, yeah, I think that's us. I don't know how we did on the eight minutes, but um, yeah, thank you. We'll be around. Um, Hi, everybody. Hello. Uh, I'm John Derrick. Um, can, can anybody hear? Hello? How's that? That whole works, right? All right. Let's see what, let's see what we got here. Oh, okay. So uh, this uh, this is a an installation and, uh, that I did at Parker's Box Gallery just about ten years ago, and uh, it's called the Slow Healing Train. And on the left, there's a character uh, known as Big Cat, uh, who I I got to sit up on that platform there, which is the Slow Healing Train, uh, and he's painting a portrait of. The artist to the right, uh, that's Kendall Glover. And so this project at Parker's Box Gallery, um, you know, the whole idea is Big Hat is a, is a character who does these, uh, he's trying to paint everybody's portrait in the whole world. And so he sets up this slow kneeling train in a lot of different locations, and then hopefully people get up on the platform and they paint each other's portraits. But they don't look at each other face to face, they look at each other on these little television monitors, and you might be able to see right in front of Big Hat there, there's a television monitor, which is uh, attached to a surveillance camera, which is looking at Kendall on the other side, and she's got a monitor in front of her, and so they're really painting each other off the TV screen, as if they're like cartoon characters or something. But Anyway, uh, so this this uh, installation performance piece was at Parker's Box Gallery, which was in Williamsburg, um, just 10 years ago, actually. Um, that uh, it was an ongoing thing. It went for about uh, six weeks, and all the portraits just kept going up and up and up. And I think it, by the end, there were about 60 portraits every day. Uh, um, I went in to make sure Big Hat was working. Um, uh, usually, sometimes I had to portray him myself, but uh, other people could portray the cat from time to time. But anyway, that's so we just filled up the gallery with these uh, with these portraits. Um, a few years later, actually in 2014, uh, I was able to get uh, to this residency in France called the Notre 21 and set up a permanent setting for Big Hat to do these portraits. And that's his studio there in Brittany. And uh, I've been going there every summer since 2014 until, uh, well, until 2019. Obviously, 2020 and since, I haven't been able to go. But that's Big Hat painting inside of that structure that you just saw called the Slow Healing Train. And they're back to back. This is Lucy Lavaugh. And, um, and there's Big Hat, and they each have a, a monitor in front of them, and you can see, you can't actually see the picture on the monitor in this uh, frame, but they would sit back to back and paint each other's portraits, and every summer Big Hat would go there and do these portraits, and there's probably, uh, I don't know, there's, there's probably about 60 or 70 portraits that have been done over there in Brittany, uh, well, well, there's probably more than that, but... Uh, Anyway, people would come. It's an art residency, and it's kind of a, in Brittany, and, and people show portraits of Big Hat. So, um, and there's a little close-up, and you can, uh, oh, this, the thing here is this is 2020. Uh, so I couldn't go over there. So Big Hat was not at the, the Notre 21 in 2020. Uh, so uh, this this is a uh, um, uh, oh, owner uh, Kaimak from Turkey, who is occupying that studio in Minotaur 21. And when we created that uh, structure over there, other artists can use that studio. They can apply to use that studio, because I would, I would only go there for about six weeks. So it's open to other artists to, uh, to apply to and go and use that studio. 
And uh, but this uh, summer, obviously 2020, I didn't go. But but this uh, this is young artist named Owner uh, Kamak from Turkey, and he was there, and he was there in that summer of 2020. So there we are. You can barely see Big Hat there. So we started doing portraits on FaceTime, and that's how uh, that's how I managed to get through the pandemic. And that Big Hat was just like, okay, we'll do it virtually, and so. There's Big Hat in his bedroom over here in Elmhurst. And, and uh, he's painting, there's a picture of owner right there in the background. Um, and uh, he did, there were a, a, a several, a number of artists going through uh, Minotri that summer. And so Big Hat wound up painting all of them and they painted all of his portraits. And that's by the way, one of his, one of his things he's trying to get everybody to paint his portrait, everybody in the world. So, you know, it's kind of, you know, he's, he's like, half narcissist and, 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 and half uh, uh, you know, the other half there, I guess, a warrior. So, uh, anyway. um, so there's Honor with this portrait of Big Hat. And so and that's Big Hat's portrait of Honor. And these sessions run about an hour. So these are like really spontaneous type of paintings. Uh, then, uh, so this is Nikki Singleton, and she uh, she was a New York artist who got displaced basically up in Canada. She was a Canadian citizen, but during the pandemic, she got stranded there, and she was pretty, you know, pretty uh, lost. So we found each other and FaceTime and did each other's portraits. That's her, uh, hers of Big Hat, and mine of Nikki Singleton, and uh, terrific painter and. Uh, by the way, this is all on the Instagram page, and usually what I do whenever I would, so this project started going on, on FaceTime, I was painting two and three portraits a day like this with people, and um, so, and, and I, they're all on, an inst on my Instagram page, which is John Beerkley Big Hat, and uh, anyway, usually whenever I would do an artist, I would also put some examples of their work as well, not just the portrait they did of Big Hat. But, uh, but Nicky is a terrific artist. You know, there's, there he is. And, and uh, did several portraits that day. So in this hour-long session, depending on who I'm working with, and I didn't work only with artists, I worked with all, all kinds of people. Uh, you know, all kinds of people got interested. This, this, is, this, this is actually an artist named Troy June who works at Elmhurst Hospital, where he did. And somehow he managed to get a, a, a get a, a little space in the basement of Elmer's Hospital, and um, during in the middle of the pandemic, and uh, this, this is like a still from the video. I probably should have put this video in there, but, but uh, uh, and there there's there's Troy in his uh, in his medical gear, and there's Troy uh, Troy's painting a big hat, my painting of Troy. And this is Valerie, the, the, the great artist Valerie Hagerty. It was like all the way to the corner back there. Um, she's, she's here too. There she is. And uh, Valerie, uh, you know, hiding behind the flowers there, you know, and um, uh, uh, as she is even tonight. So, uh, and there's her portrait of Big Hat. Big Hat's portrait of, of Valerie. I think we did three or four that day, but I'm just I'm trying to stick in that eight minutes here. So. So there's just like a huge pile of these portraits uh, in, in, a, in a giant, uh, several portfolios that are, uh, and this is Ajima Kojo, who uh, is an artist I work with uh, in, in at different times, and that's his, his uh, portrait of Big Hat. Uh, Ajima is in, just in South Brooklyn, but we are buddies for a long time. I lived in Brooklyn before I came to Jackson Heights. I was over there for 29 years. and. And uh, so we, you know, the distance became greater for all of us during the pandemic. You could live across the street and you didn't see each other. So I hadn't seen Ajwa in a while. We hooked up on the internet there and we uh, did each other's portraits. And so this is, this is just all happening like right, you know, two years ago. Through, uh, this was in April 2020. So it, and oh. That's Linda. <laughs> no, Linda. No, I, I haven't seen Linda in, it seemed like ages since I'd seen Linda. So I called her up there and the face time. I said, Linda, how about a portrait? And she said, uh, with Big Hat. And she said, okay. 
And there's her, she did a terrific, there's Big Hat down in the corner. And uh, as, as the project continued, uh, well, there's, there's Big Hat's portrait of her. And he's still, you know, still working in the bedroom in, in, uh, in Elmhurst, which was really a drag to share the bedroom with Big Hat all the time. So, uh, but I liked the work he was doing, and I especially liked the company from all the other artists visiting uh, Big Hat. So there's Linda's drawing, terrific drawing. Big Hat's portrait. And so this little signature thing in the upper left hand corner started appearing in most of these portraits where, you know, the, the, the little cartouche that you get when you're talking on FaceTime? Well, I had to start putting that, and I had to put, that's basically Big Hat's signature. So uh, now this is Carlos Reykjavik's, and he's a he, he makes massive sculptures. He's and he's down in South Brooklyn, and he just so he couldn't do that. So so he was just going crazy with the charcoal, and and uh, there's Big Hat's portrait, Carlos. What's it? How do you his last name? Reykjavik's. He's yeah. Reykjavik's. Yeah, with an S on the end. Yeah. And that's Big Hats. There's Carlos, the Big Hat. Uh, th this is a former student of mine named David Kurt and his daughter. So I started getting into family portraits. And uh, David uh, now teaches. And there, this was his, you know, because yeah, he's obviously a really good teacher and very clever. And because he did the computer, you know, he, he used the computer. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> very academic. But terrific guy, really smart. You know, when I had these students, I, I knew they were all smarter than me. They just didn't know it at the time, and now they're proving it. So uh, anyway, there's his setup in his backyard. This is how he lived out the pandemic. Another family portrait, Alex Jingro and Michael Scoggins, and young, their young daughter, Scout, who's now on her way to be a, like a, a famous artist, young Scout. How did her parents are, I think. And there's a big ass portrait of them. And this is, uh, oh, this is a great one. This is by Yeun Min from South Korea. And she and I have known each other from the residency in France uh, uh, many years ago. And uh, so, uh, but she was kind of, she was stranded over there in, in South Korea because she usually spends half a year in France and half a year in South Korea. And there she is. She did her first big hat. Line of Yayun. And now at this point, things were opening up, you all remember, in the pandemic. So uh, I had a, the, the residency that I was doing in France somehow hooked me up with this residency on Governor's Island. So I moved out to Governor's Island, and I no longer had the slow healing train, so I set up a slow healing tent uh, in, in a building on Governor's Island. And there's, and so I started doing portraits out there in this in this little tent that was set up in one of those buildings on Governor's Island at the Triangle Residency. Uh, and this is my sister right here. And her she's, her hat is bigger than big hats. I don't know. <laughs> so, so, and that's her setup. She's a photographer. And she says, I can't draw, but I don't know. I like that drawing. But, uh, um, and then, uh, I started painting the people at Minotra 21 again, and there's the uh, owner again, and there's the, the slow healing train, and that's Alan Williams, the director of, uh, of Minotra 21, and you can up in the right-hand corner, you can see the slow healing tent at the residency out on Governor's Island. So it's become this project of linking residencies all of a sudden. And there's the tent, and, the, and you know, and I started liking this better than the French setup, actually. It's, Governor's Island's pretty cool. Uh, so landscapes started to come in and everything else. There's the little landscape. There's, there's the slow healing train over in France. And I'm painting it from the slow healing tent in Governor's Island. And then somebody over there, at the, uh, the great writer Karen Wilkins saw this. So she, and, and there was, I guess there was nothing going on there in the pandemic. So she wrote this nice article about it in, in, in the, in the, in the uh, in a Wall Street Journal. And that was awesome. It was uh, so, I was, and that's my picture of Alan, the director of the residency. 
And this is the last slide. So you saw that they were, my colors on this project have always been red and blue. Well, I'm, we're working on this. I'm working on this with Alan Wiggs over at the, the uh, uh, residency there, Monroe 21, and also on Governor's Island. Uh, there's a lot of displaced artists, as we all know, from the Ukraine that have no studios, no place to live, and they're just they're, they're without a place to be. So this is my proposal to Alan over there at the residency in France to paint the red out, put the yellow in, and we're working on a, on a grant to get a Ukrainian artist to come and occupy this for some. That's it. everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, my name is James Cullinane. Um, I live in Jackson Heights. I've had for um, And I just have uh, a group sampling of some of my work. I have eight pieces. Um, this was uh, just a I mean, most most of these things are not Jewish. Um, this one's called Rec Res Rec Res Resurrection, uh, and it's forty inches by twenty eight inches. Um, and I guess I could say about the work that there's a combination of a certain kind of um, what, like a, uh, I mean, I don't know what, what the works are going to look like. A lot of them wind up becoming the beginning of a second piece and a third piece, and there's a lot of layering. So, for example, on some of the blue areas, it's actually cut out and other things are added. So I, I work that way with them. Some drawing like this, I might have, have used two or three other you know, 40 by 30 pieces of paper and taking parts of them. So, um, that's fun. This one is upside down. <laughs> it's called uh, Negative Capability Blues and it's 40 by 28. Uh, this is a diptych. It's bigger. It's 41 by 56 overall. And it's called Sarcophagus blues, and uh, a lot of these were done during the pandemic. Um, I, I would say this work was partly influenced by just looking at Roman sarcophagi in the net. And, uh, it's not a literal. Uh, oh, can you hear me still? Sorry. It's not a literal uh, representation of anything, obviously, but I was aware when I finished working on the piece that it had a certain rhythm that corresponded to uh, certain alpha guy freezes where figures are moving through space. Uh, this one is uh, called Ford Vacuum. It's small. It's um, 20 inches by 16 inches. Um, I, I've used that form, that Taurus form, in the center in a whole series of, of paintings in the last few years. And the, the dots are actual napkins. I mean, I guess I could say a little more that I used to do large scale, very large scale, site specific, um, site specific installations where I would build uh, figures out of nails or push pins and they would be Again, like 18 to 20 feet high, uh, and I did a lot of those. And then I, I basically uh, decided that I wanted to attempt to make a painting again. And I think it was, I don't know, I'm going to say five years before I did a painting that I liked. <laughs> and um, one of the things I liked uh, about using the push pins is, is there's I'm interested in the tactile relationship between materials and pictorial space and attention involved in that. So that's another one. Okay. 
This one is called Sparrow's Point. It's a diptych. It's 32 by 20. It's not huge. It's ink and collage. Uh, the ellipses are from another another drawing I was working on. So they do use parts and move them over another drawing. Sparrow's Point is a the name of a this huge steel mill in, in Baltimore that uh, I have a lot of uh, associations with. I, I worked for a couple of years as a studio assistant for Richard Serra and um, was responsible for transport and installation of these 70 ton steel plates. And uh, I learned a lot about steel mills and um, one of the last, one of the first ellipses, if you ever go to Dia Beacon, he's got one there. And um, they're all built in Germany now because they're far superior technically than we are now. And Sparrow's Point is shrunk in size, but the first one was built there. So for me, that's where the title comes from. This one is uh, also a diptych. It's 21 by 12. It's called Sky Over Sandtown. Sandtown is a neighborhood uh, in West Baltimore where Freddie Gray was murdered by the police. Um, and you know, I'm certainly making reference to that. But you know, the work is is again there's the map pins, but the work is it's formal. The titles usually come afterwards. I don't strive to represent a title or you know to make some necessarily big political statement, yeah. but you know, I grew up down there and I've, I've seen that how the economic conditions and the racism and the segregation and the police brutality uh, all made me want to move here. <laughs> <laughs> this is a fairly large one. It's called Key. It's 30 by 22. It's wash and ink on paper. Um, Again, it's just an abstract piece. A lot of these I will work on for, I don't know, two months, you know, and I, and I try and look a lot more than I draw, take my time with it. And uh, last one. This one's called the GM32. Uh, it's paint stick, oil, spray paint, wash. Um, and, and I mean, I guess one thing I would say is, you know, I, I do think drawing is like a, a seismograph for who you are and for the, for the world in general. But I also don't completely trust the paradigm of uh, express, expressive, romantic, whatever, like the, the jazz solo. Um, I think that's a little bit outdated, so I don't completely trust it, but it's, it's a good, uh, you know, it's still there. But I try and, I don't try, other formal elements come in that, I guess, counterbalance that impulse. And um, I don't know, I just work on something until I feel like I've surprised myself or I've done something I don't know. And um, I guess that's about it. Thank you. I also want to mention that James has two pieces on the wall up here flanking the large blue piece in the middle. Hi, can you hear me? Turn my back. So I'm going to present. No, no, no. You can't hear me? No. Can you can you hear me better now? I think I got the last one. Okay, I'm gonna I'm presenting um, an exhibition that I just had that um, was at a gallery called Shrine in the Lower East Side. It, it closed actually about ten days ago. Um, and it was a, a big grid installation of paintings like this. Um, I started with uh, making paintings that were kind of experimenting with transparent acrylic layers and 
kind of repeating motifs. Um, and it, it sort of created like an optical effect with the paintings where there's kind of like a frequency or like a vibration that would happen optically with the paintings. Um, and then these, that, this is the opposite side of the wall. You can see like kind of like a big presentation on one side and then, oh, sorry, <laughs> and then um, the opposite wall were smaller studies that I had made to sort of figure out the larger paintings. This is one of those smaller studies and it was a lot about just figuring out how to use the paint in a transparent way and um, to get a vibration effect and also experimenting with color layers. Um, and a lot of the paintings are very abstracted versions of, I was calling them portraits of women. This is one of those smaller studies also. Um, and I just kind of loved experimenting with the texture. I use a lot of paint rollers to apply the paint. Um, so I can kind of get that like, you know, the texture happening. Um, and so this is a small painting, 12 by 12 inches. And then this is a, a larger version of that paint that's 36 by 36 inches. So you can see that it kind of softens the texture and layers kind of soften as you get larger. A little more subtle. This was one of my favorite paintings from this series just because it, um, I thought it really successfully did this kind of buzzing optical trick and it kind of reminds me of like a radio tower or some sort of, um, yeah, like some kind of beacon or something. And this is another painting in this series that obviously is a little different. It's, it's using hands instead of the portrait element. Um, and it's kind of the same hand that's repeated over and over to create the, the background that kind of looks like a, a basket. It's just the same shape that's been flipped and repeated to kind of make the entire image. And then this is just a, a studio shot. I was like going peeking into an artist's studio and seeing how the work is made. So this is my studio and I sort of had planned the grid installation from the beginning and so I had it hung in my studio this way just so I could um, sort of envision what the, the final piece would look like. And my studio is very dusty so I have, have plastic often that was covering the paintings just to protect them. And then someone on a photographer on Instagram um, contacted me and did portraits of artists in their studio. So he came one day and took some pictures of me just working in my studio. So this is from that. And then this is the, the finished painting and this is in that other photo. And a lot of these these paintings are uh, are there's no room for error. The, the layers are really thin of acrylic and um, so this painting I, I did twice, this is the second version of it, because if there's even ever like just a tiny little piece of lint or, or any like small thing that could mar the surface, it kind of ruins the overall effect. So I probably made twice as many paintings as I had in the show just because I had to throw away paintings if, if something bled or something happened or there was some kind of mark. And this is kind of an experimental painting that I made in the series that is interesting to me just because of the, the layering of the colors and it's kind of doing something interesting with the light, like the pink has this kind of gauzy effect that almost feels like nylon or something that's like encircling the, the heads. And so that, that I feel like was very successful in a sense of like just giving you that feeling of light and, and almost speed, like it almost looks like it has some motion to it. And then this is a detail. These paints are much different when you actually see them in person. In, in photographs, they tend to flatten out and become really graphic, but there is like a lot of texture and like painter unique elements to them. Here's another 
or something like that. Um, and then this is also another, I would say, another hand that's kind of repeated. You can see, like, just the color um, layers and what happens, like, when the color begins to layer together. Here's a detail of that. <laughs> and then this is kind of back to the study. This was one of the first small paintings that I did that just experimented with the with like a spectrum of colors and I kind of I really loved this one in the end just because it, it sort of had a magical quality of kind of combining colors and sort of emitting light in a way and I have I have an identical twin sister so I think that I'm often due to reflection and mirroring and, um, and I think that is part of the subject matter of the work is sort of seeing myself in another self, you know, sort of on a daily basis. And then this is the last uh, painting, which is also a study, which is one of my favorites, which is why I ended, I mean, the, the palette, it's a much more neutral palette, um, but I just kind of love the, the coloring and the pattern. That's it. <laughs> Um, congratulations to all the other artists. I want your uh, story space. <laughs> uh, my name is Cristian Pietrapiana, and uh, I'm originally from Argentina. I've been here for many years, Sunnyside, Long Island City. What I have today is uh, just one series, it's ongoing. Um, I come from a family that they are very into the environment. I inherited that. I uh, have a deep respect for the environment. And uh, five years ago, I had to leave my studio in Greenpoint because of all the developments that happened there that you're probably aware of. And I had to start painting my apartment in a small room, which I'm fine with that. But I had to reduce myself instead of painting large oils. I started to read the news again. And thanks to some friends of mine, they got me into Alan Weissman and Bill McKibben and Elizabeth Kohlberg, and I started to get somehow obsessed about our climate crisis. Uh, my friends and my artists in Long Island City, when they see me come, they run away because they're like, okay, he's obsessed with the climate crisis. Um, so what I started to do was uh, try to find news, especially in the New York Times, uh, about coverage on climate change. And without noticing, I started to make marks and write stuff on it. And this sort of series developed, where I do these interventions on the news spread. Uh, sometimes I do glue them on paper, sometimes not. And I started to play with the news, the headlines, sometimes combining the article with whatever the advertising is next to it. Uh, sometimes it's a successful piece, sometimes it's not. Uh, this one is obviously about our Arctic melting. Uh, it's all basically ink and acrylic paint. Uh, I'm into all the species that are vanishing. You can read the latest UN report on that, which is quite depressing. And I started to work with lines and patterns and not too many colors as I used to. So these individual pieces, I started to combine them with other ones. So it can be a single piece, or you can have a diptych or a triptych, and what I'm doing lately is huge installations, like a mural covering the entire wall. Um, this one is not the New York Times, this is a Chilean newspaper from a residency that I've been there twice, and it's obviously between you know, the struggle of the Amazon and the cattle ranchers that are taking over. Um, here you have a triptych, uh, the first one is a Danish newspaper, the second one is the Times, the third one is an Argentinian newspaper. Um, the last piece on the right talks about the lack of uh, drinking water that children lack 
in many parts of South America. Um, did I start questioning myself whether this is actually painting or is painterly? Am I being didactic? Am I pressing too much on brainwashing? I think about that every day. Uh, unfortunately, the more I read about climate crisis, I think that every platform should be used to bring awareness and let climate change be part of the conversation. Um, this is a whole bunch, it's like a pretty big installation. Uh, I have some pieces that have to do with gun reform. Uh, I used to work a lot with corruption, um, but most of it is the climate check crisis, which is a huge theme. It's a big umbrella that many things are related to that. Uh, this one is pretty recent, that I started to add more color, and I combine them again. It's a, I work in grids, so the, chi the, the sizes can change. This is another big one. There's a newspaper on paper. That's uh, in a gallery in Chile before the pandemic. This is pretty recent. It's in a gallery in Connecticut. Uh, again, I'm more with less color and a lot of ink, a lot of pen. Uh, the other thing about these pieces is that you can read it aesthetically from a distance, or if you choose to do so, you can get close to it, get into each piece. If you want, you can read whatever headline is there, or you can pay attention to the grids and the patterns that I make with lines. That's it. Um, thank you. And if you're interested, please contact your government representatives and demand strict legislation and climate change. We're drowning. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to uh, show some drawings, uh, drawing-based paintings. So, uh, um, I'm an artist, uh, work, I work on uh, varied media, uh, installation, photograph, objects, uh, painting, drawing, um, yeah, um, mixed media. So, this is one of the uh, ongoing series of my paperwork that I have been working on last um, roughly started just before the um, pandemic, then I continued um, uh, this work on paper. So my boss, this series are based on South Asian history, um, uh, focusing on Bengal. Bengal is the reason in uh, uh, South Asia, which is, which used to be a capital before, like some few years, a uh, few um, hundred years before. And then it was, um, um, the region was very prolific. Um, and my, um, I collected so many resources from there, there um, um, uh, from the museum, from um, artifacts, from old buildings, from histories. So I edited, re-edited it, um, and then included in my works. So you might see some um, um, some drawing of human, drawing of geometric shapes, which came from South Asia uh, centuries before a lot of um, migrants, they used to come for business or for living from um, um, Middle East or uh, Turkey or from uh, Persia. So I started from the history of uh, South Asia um, uh, migration history. So this one of the, uh, this is, uh, say I've been using also same images, uh, but transferred into different media. Uh, these are, uh, this, uh, this work is uh, one wood, uh, Mahabodhi wood, so I work with a uh, collaborator who helped cut the uh, wood carving. Um, so it's also the same image um, that I transferred into wood. Um, yeah. You can see some images of uh, um, how can I say, it um, um, looks like emperor, but I uh, collected images of uh, 
or some families who, whose forefather was a local feudal dog. So in South Asia, traditionally, uh, each, um, each region um, had uh, local nobs. Lo local nobs is like who collected revenues from the local people or workers. So uh, it's like a small part, small chunk of history from those um, those local freedom nobs and uh, um, how they govern the local region. This is uh, another one. The size of this block is um, four feet by three feet, thirty-six inch by forty-eight inch. And this is wood. Right? Uh, this one wood. Is it a relief? Really, slightly. It's like uh, roughly like one uh, five millimeter relief. Maybe seven, five to seven millimeters. Cut by hand. Cut by hand. Yeah, it's still uh, in South Asia, uh, people, uh, women, girls, they used to work, they wear sharis and salwar. So, uh, wood block cut, they cut the wood and drop on, on, the, um, on the fabric. So, I collaborated with a, uh, with a uh, artisan who, who is very expert on carving. So, uh, this is uh, also image, uh, drawing image of on paper. So, uh, I see during the pandemic, I did uh, numerous drawing of, uh, of this series. So, uh, you can see one local uh, now emperor, he is uh, nodding himself towards uh, below and uh, there are some owls, image of owls, which I, um, uh, which I uh, imply as an intellect, because uh, they are controlled by British um, um, lords uh, who colonized South Asia for about 200 centuries. And on top of uh, uh, his head is a tiger, tiger is symbol of the animal. So, Type, skeleton of tiger. They, they don't have any power, but they have a sense of uh, skeleton. So it's like um, it's kind of an image of uh, those history. Uh, this is also all of these works are uh, the same image uh, 25 by 35 inch. Um, I also color, uh, I call it the paper. Homemade paper. I collaborated with a uh, person who worked for a paper, a handmade paper factory. So he produced especially for me about like, 500 pieces of paper. Where, where was the that? In, uh, in Bangladesh. I'm, I'm from Bangladesh. I uh, migrated two years, like um, 10 years before 10 years ago. I went back. Again, I came back like, in 2016. So I collaborated with the, the, the people um, who is on, who used to produce um, paper, my paper. So um, I I terminate, I didn't terminate the ages. I just left uh, as how he produced. Um, I wanted to imply how uh, these two is uh, can be connected with each other. So I didn't make. I will make it very straight or sharp edge. So this one, one of the another image of local uh, people now who who is watching towards the uh, his land. Uh, most of them uh, they migrated from Persia or Turkey because uh, South Asia was uh, governed by ruled by. Um, um, Mughal um, emperors, so they are kind of not related to the Mughal. Each region or each small area had used to have north. Um, yeah, this kind of safe, yeah, safe images of this history. What's the size of those cast? Uh, all of, all of the, uh, 
of this one. Quantified by Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, that's all we have for you. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you to the artists. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I mean, once again, I want to just repeat what I shared at the beginning. To see this many people in a room like this, and for such a long time, it's really, really rewarding. Um, I want to also mention that in the Epicenter newsletter, every Tuesday, we feature a local artist. And you've seen some of their artists today, and if anybody's encouraged, send us your work. This could be written work, photography, work, anything that you would like to share with us. I will say that you know it's selected. We offer a dollar stipend because you know this is something that we you are offering to us, and this is something we want to uh, include in our in our in our network. And you know, hopefully, more events like this. I want to also say thank you so much, Linda, for you know, <laughs> well, um, is the creative director at Epicenter, and is also one of the featured on the wall tonight.